never be more love than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. Does it take a trophy to make you proud? I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Ooh. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross an ocean, so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. Let's sing it all, y'all. You are a child. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're glad to be in the house of God this morning. Thank you so much for those that are in-house and those that have joined us on live feed. Appreciate you being here with us today. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to touch and minister in our Sunday school class today. Uh, we have several. We have just a few that are on the road traveling, so we want to be much in prayer for them. We do have some that are sick. We want to continue to be praying uh, for each of them. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm tired of... I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for folks that are sick, but I'm tired of having to say we got folks sick. I'm ready for everybody to get healed and uh, get delivered from this sickness. So uh, let's continue to be praying for those that are sick and praying that God will touch and minister in their lives. If you 
have joined us on live feed and you have a prayer request, text the keyword prayer to 205-642-8744. Uh, we want to partner together with you in prayer. If you're in-house and got a prayer request, they'll be known by lifting your hand. God knows each and every need. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer today. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today again. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for this great opportunity that you've allowed us to come to worship and praise you. Father, today I pray that you'll move and minister in a mighty way in our Sunday school lessons today. Father, I pray that you'll touch every teacher as they're bringing forth your word. I pray, Father, that as you as they've studied throughout this week, I pray, Father, that you'll bring it back to their mindsets as they bring it forth to their students today. Touch every student today, Father God, that they will be able to hear, retain, and understand your word as these lessons come forth. From the nursery, kids class, teen, young adult, here in the sanctuary, those that are in-house and live feet alike. You see those that are on the road traveling. You see those that are sick. You see those that have had uh, doctor's appointments this last week and, and, and this upcoming week. Father God, you see the good and the bad medical reports. And I'm praying, Father, you'll move and minister in every heart and every life. We forever give you the praise in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, this morning, the title of our Sunday school lesson is Live Victoriously in Christ. Live Victoriously in Christ. We are continuing looking at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We're continuing to look through there uh, in our unit today. And the, again, the title is Live Victoriously in Christ. What we must do is we need to understand our central truth. What we're tr looking at is that Christians can live confidently and victoriously in Christ. Christians can live confidently and victoriously in Christ. As a Christian, I'm confident in knowing that I'm a child of God. Amen? There's too many times that we have Christians, they walk around in defeatism, there's too many times that we have Christians that they're walking down, uh, they look gloom and doom all the time. What we must understand is I live confidently and I am victorious in my Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to focus on knowing and rejoicing in the assurances we have as Christians. We need to know and rejoice in the assurances we have as Christians. As a child of God, I am a child of God. And therefore, I have assurances, and I can rejoice in the fact that I'm a child of God. I am the head, not the tail. The devil cannot, does not have authority over me and my life. I can pray over those that are sick in my family, over those sick in this church. Over the, over, I can pray over my finances. I can pray over my life. And I understand that I have assurances because I am a Christian. Our emphasis that we're going to look at today is through salvation. Anyone can receive the power and hope needed to endure the storms of life. There are storms in life. There are changes that comes about in our lives. There are things that happens and it seems like it's the up and the down. Uh, it seems like things are going great and then you go to the doctor and you get a bad report. Uh, there's things going great and all of a sudden your finances get all discombobulated. There are things that happen. Those are the storms of life. But guess what? We have the power and the hope that we can endure those storms in life. That we can go, that we, it's not, it's not that we go through those and don't have to worry about it. Guess what? He didn't remove the fiery furnace. He was in the middle of the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew children. And we've got to understand, is as a Christian, we can Endure the storms of life. Take a look at 1 John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. It says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. The faith of a grain of mustard seed can speak to this mountain and it would be removed. Too many times, and I can't tell you how many times, 
as, as a pastor that I have heard many, 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 many church folks, many Christians, why am I facing this? Why am I going through this? Why? God says he won't put more on me than I can bear. Well, first of all, we're misquoting that verse, but we need to understand something, that as long as I have faith, God is going to help me through whatever the storms is. It doesn't mean I'm not going to go through a storm. It means that I am going to overcome the trials in life. Why? My faith. In chapter 5, the apostle John, he summarizes what he has taught in the first epistle. He begins by reminding us we need to be born again. What we must realize and understand is if somebody is not saved, what they need to focus on is salvation. It's not going through a problem, going through a trial, uh, uh, enduring this, enduring that. Yes, we want to make sure that we do those things. But first and foremost, our soul needs to be saved. Well, I've prayed with people. I've prayed for somebody. I've prayed uh, with family about somebody else. And that person that we're praying for is not saved. Sure, I'm praying that, that they'll receive a healing. Sure, I'm praying that they, they're going to be set free. But first and foremost, I'm praying that their soul gets saved. Yesterday, uh, no, excuse me, Friday, uh, Friday night was having supper. Having supper. And, and I was talking uh, with the, the person that was sitting across the table from us. Uh, I was talking there with this, this gentleman. And we was talking about the fact that people... Um, People leave churches. We was talking about the fact that uh, people get upset at, at so-and-so church and then they'll go to this other church down the road and they'll, they'll do this and they'll go over here. And then yesterday I read an article concerning, it, concerning um, church, tra uh, it says, uh, church transfer, transfer growth. How that we, that's now a new thing of transfer growth. Uh, for people, they'll, they'll move from one church to another church. And what I, what I, we was talking about how that that takes place. And what we must realize and understand is probably, I would venture to say 60% of the time when there is that transfer is because they're hearing something from a pulpit that they do not appreciate. And it's causing a change in their life. And I'm not saying that that's happening here. I'm not saying it's happening over yonder. Just conversation, reading articles, this is something that's going on. Why is this important? Because more important than anything else is the status of our souls. New birth, the salvation, being saved, comes about by believing on Jesus Christ and receiving Him as our Savior. John emphasizes these things. John confirms that they are confronted, excuse me, John confronted at that time, and he's also telling us it needs to happen today. He confronted false teachers of his day. Many of the false teachers at that time had arisen and denied Jesus as the Son of God. The apostle declared, these apostle, the, the apostle declared these imposters, say that five times fast. The apostle declared these imp imposters that they have no part of the kingdom of God. They are to be resisted and they are to be rejected. It is, I say comical, but it's not comical. It's not comical at all. But it is really comical to look at, and again, please understand, it's not comical. But it is a comical to look at, I don't know another word to put there. Y'all help me figure out a word and I'll throw that in there. But it is weird, it is unusual, it is strange to look at the number of people that they lean on, TikTok pastors, YouTube pastors, and they, if you stop and you listen to them, you understand that there are false doctrines and false teachers that are being brought forth by some of these. I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying some of those there are. But yet many will flock to those folks. What we've got to realize is we need to confront those. We need to confront those teachings of that. And we need to resist and reject that false narrative. There is no place for that false prophet, false doctrine, false teachers 
to have a place in the community of believers. What we need to realize, as a child of God, there is victory. There is victory. We sing about it. We shout about it. We pray for victory. Why do we not live out that victory? Why do we not live in victory so that others can see Christ Jesus in us? Our lifestyle will either draw others or turn them away from Jesus. Over the past couple of days, me and Miss Katie, we got out of town. This wasn't a church event. We got out of town. We had fun. But even in that, there was several people that we come, this was not a church event. wasn't a devil event. Don't anybody get thinking and crazy. It wasn't a church event. It was not a church of God event. But Brother Mike, do you know that there were several people that we had contact, we was talking with. And we actually had one asked us to pray for them about something. Had another one. I actually met a pastor there. And we had a nice conversation. Church comes up in all of those things. Why, is that, why am I telling that? Why is that important? Because our lifestyles, doesn't matter if it's a church event or a non-church event. The way we live our life, and when I say non-church event, that does not mean a devil event. That just means it's not a church event, okay? Y'all need to understand. There is things in life, okay? But, you know, you can go bowling. That's a non-church event, even if you have a bunch of church folks there, okay? We need to understand that there are, I mean, you know, everything needs to revolve around God, but you need to get that. There's still victory in Christ. We need to live that even around the around in a non-church environment. Does that make sense? We need to live that. When you go to the grocery store, that ain't a church event, is it? You go to the grocery store and buy groceries. We need to understand that in those things, we need to live out Christ. What an awesome responsibility we have to live a way that unbelievers will want to experience what we have and what we are presenting to those around us. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us this. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's go forward and let's take a look at this. First of all, let's take a look at victory over the evil world. Victory over the evil world. Take a look at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be looking at, you can turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We're going to be starting at verse 1. Let's read verses 1, 2, and 3. 1 John chapter 5, 1, 2, and 3. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome they're not grievous they're not a load a tiring thing on our on our lives believing Jesus is the son of God believing that Jesus is the savior believing that Jesus is the Messiah this is a reoccurring theme in the writings of John In fact, he gave this theme as a reason for writing the gospel. Usually when you read something, I remember this all the way back to high school English. Oh, Lord, my high school English teachers would be glad I remembered something. But I remember this way back even to then, that your first sentence of your paragraph needs to be a theme or needs to be what that paragraph is going to be about, and the rest of the paragraph is supporting 
uh, supporting that, that original theme. And then if you're writing a story, you're writing a book, you know, you need the first couple of paragraphs needs to sort of lay out a theme or an outline of the direction you're going to be going and everything needs to support that. Well, that's what John did before English was a thing. He, did, he laid this out before uh, my English teachers even taught this. Okay, He laid all of this out in the first uh, sections of his writing. Although he could not record everything, his writings, John's writings was designed to aid you and I as believers in Jesus Christ in our lives. We need to realize not everything was written in the Bible. There are historical documents that is not biblical based. They're not Bible, but there are historical documents. And actually, John, if I'm not mistaken, one of our verses even today actually goes back and references those things. And so what we must realize and understand is there's historical documents that document the life of Christ that's not in the Bible, but they all intertwine with one another. They support one another. Does that make sense? And so we must understand is that everything could not be written in the Bible. John chapter, uh, excuse me, St. John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, and the Bible says they were not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in him. The message of the false prophets, remember we just spoke about that there was false prophets of the day, and those false prophets, John is writing and he's telling them, and he confronted those false prophets. The message of those false prophets who, who troubled the church of John's day was a denial that Jesus was the Messiah. It was a denial of the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, John makes it clear that anyone who believes in his or her heart that Jesus is Christ, that person is a child of God. We need to believe. Now, we know that to be saved, you believe. That's, the, that's it. I spoke to someone this last week. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a requirement to be saved. Being saved is, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the requirement of salvation. Amen? But to remain saved, there is a walk that we have to do. There is something that we have to do. There is a life that we have to live. When we're born again, born again, we're born into a new family, the family of God. We are surrounded now by brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's a common bond. This common bond draws us to one another. This pastor that I met yesterday, we did not discuss church to begin with. There was not a, that it wasn't brought out about, oh, by the way, I'm a pastor. I didn't have a shirt that says, me, pastor. It didn't, I mean, nothing like that was going on. But Brother Larry, before the conversation was over with, we, I'm a pastor, he's a pastor, his wife was sitting there, Katie was standing beside me. Before it was over with, we start sharing with one another. Why? There is a common bond of for Christians to draw one another to each other. It's almost like you're walking around with a light bulb over your head. Everybody, you know that that person's a Christian. Why? You just, there's a common bond there. Our spirit will bear witness with one another. Amen? And that's how you know. We enjoy a holy life for one another that this world knows nothing about. They can only wonder and marvel at the bond that exists between believers. We're children of God. There's a bond there. There's, a, there's something that draws us together, draws us to one another. That is what we live. We love that, right? We want that to happen. We frequently hear our love for one an, an, uh, another believers is our evidence for our love of God. In verse 2, 
we see here our love for God is evidence of our love for His children. Friendships can be formed. I've had people to misquote the scripture that says, Do not be unequally yoked. Therefore, I don't need to have friends that are not Christians. That is hogwash. I have friends that are not Christians. There's times I want to beat them in the head with a ball bat that I got friends that are not Christians. Now, most of the time, my friends that are not Christians, they respect me and they, they, they have reverence in the fact they don't use a lot of foul language. There's sometimes they slip up, but they don't use a lot of foul language. They don't do things around me that they know that I'm not going to, that, that doesn't sit right with me. I don't have to say, I've had, people, I've had Christians tell me, well, I tell them, bless God, you better not do it. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I promise you, if they have any kind of respect for you as a, as a Christian, they're not going to. Why? Because you're showing respect to them as well. By this, we know that we love the children of God and we love other people. We love others that are not Christians. We're supposed to love them. I don't love their lifestyle. I don't love the way they live their life. I don't love the way they act. But I can still love them, right? This is what shows that we are children of God. Why? We need that. We need those relationships. It's, it's about relationships. When we have that relationship one with another, and we help one another, we're there for one another, that shows that we're children of God. The love of God is coupled with obedience to God, keeping God's commands. When we obey the commands of God, we show our love is more than just a profession. Our deeds, our actions, the way, we, the way we're motivated about life, the way we live our life, the way we do things is genuine. Some people have the wrong idea about the commands of God. They view them as hard and difficult to obey. They're not hard. They're not difficult. They do not realize that as we walk in the commands of God, we walk in the commands of God by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. God helps us to obey His commands. Jesus made it clear about the invitation He extended to all who hear. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, He says, Come unto me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden. Look at, put verse 3 on the screens. I'm going to read the rest of 28 and 30. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. And I want you to look at what verse 3 says. Come unto me, all you are heavy, who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. The last part of these, this passage of scripture says this. It says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse 3 tells us this. He says, and his commandments are not burdensome. What we must understand and realize very quickly, what we must understand and realize very quickly is the fact living for God is not hard. It's not difficult. It's not cumbersome. It's not burdensome. It is very easy. Amen. Let's go on. Let's take a look at verse 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John identifies here the overcomers as those who are born of God. Apart from the new birth, apart from the new birth, we cannot be triumphant in this life or the life to come. We cannot be triumphant in the things of this life. But being born of God, being born again, 
we can stand toe to toe, we can stand face to face, and we can we can take anything the world throws at us and we come out victorious. When we're a child of God, when the things of this world comes against us, we still come out victorious in the end. The God, lowercase g, of this world is no match for a child of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He who is within us is greater than he that is in the world. When we stand toe-to-toe to the things of this world, the things of this world is no match for a child of God. We are Christ-centered in our life. As long as our faith is anchored in God, the, prim- the promises of this world, the threats of this world, do not move us. We are more than conquerors through Him that has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, the principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will separate us from the love of God. What separates us? We do. Our will is what separates us from God. Nothing else can separate us. You can't separate me from God. You cannot separate me from the love of God. What separate? What would separate me from the love of God? Me, myself, and I. My will, my actions, the things I do in my life. What we believe about Jesus and the extent of our trust in Him will determine the degree of which we live an overcoming life. Let me say that again. When we believe or excuse me, what we believe about Jesus and the extent of our trust in Him will determine the degree in which we live an overcoming life. What we must understand and we must realize is I'm a child of God. What I believe about Jesus, the things I believe about Jesus, And my trust in Him will determine the overcoming life that I live. I'm not defeated. I'm a child of God. Things may come at me. Things may try to tear me down. But at the end of the day, I'm still a child of God. What I believe about God, what I believe about Jesus, my faith and my trust and my dependence on Him, that's what determines the degree of my overcoming life. Do we believe that He's the Messiah? Do we embrace Him and His supernatural birth? Do we accept Him as our Savior, our Lord, our King, our Redeemer? Only when we come to grips with the truth can we expect to have the benefits of a life with Him. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 tells us that only then can we give thanksgiving to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next section. Those who believe have eternal life. Those who believe have eternal life. You can take a look at 1 John 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13. 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. We're going to start off at verse water and blood. Blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because He is, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify. 
People say all the time that there's not anything about the Trinity. Well, verse 6 says there's, there are three that testify. Verse 8, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree. The Spirit, the water, the blood, these three agree. John continues to assert that Jesus is the Son of God. And verse 6 tells us that he gives us support in the declaration of the witness of water. Talking about Jesus' baptism and his attestment to God as the Father. What greater witness can there be to have God himself when Jesus was baptized in water? I've been baptized multiple times. My pastor thought I needed to be dunked more than once. I think he wanted to hold me under a couple of times. But not one time that I was baptized in water was there a voice from the heavens. But when Jesus was baptized by water, there's a voice came from the heavens that says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Not only did the Father give and voice His approval, but the Holy Spirit, descended as a dove and sat on his shoulder in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 3. Jesus' baptism was the first step of his journey toward fulfilling all righteousness. People talk about all the time that there's no such thing as the Trinity and that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three in one, that we're, that we're foolish in that. Well, Jesus was baptized, the Father's voice and the Holy Spirit, all three was there that day. I don't know how much clearer you can get. They all three agree. We also know in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, the proof that Jesus is the Son of God is not seen only by the baptism of water, but it is also shown by the shedding of blood on the cross Jesus did something that no one else could have done he made salvation available to all mankind the apostle wants us to know the one who died at Calvary the one whom John baptized in water in the river Jordan, the blood that was shed on the hill called Calvary, that's precious blood, that special blood, that atoning blood, the only blood that could cleanse sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When the soldier in John chapter 19 and verse 34 when the soldier pierced Jesus' side and the blood and water came out. This offers more proof that he who died on the cross, on the center cross of three. Maybe I'll preach that one day. Why was there three crosses? Something for you to think about and dig into. But, the, but when Jesus died and blood and water came out of him when the soldier pierced his side, that death was real. The resurrection was real. I don't know about you, but if somebody pierced me in the side like that, it hurt. It hurt. And what we got to realize, Jesus did it. He didn't. Yeah, he was human. It hurt. But he did it, and he held on for the love that he has for you and I. Let's go on down to verse 9 through 11. Verse 9 through 11. If we receive the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has been born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God 
has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. There are numerous ways to the cross. There's only one way to God. There's numerous ways to the cross. There's numerous ways to salvation. But the only way to God is through the cross of Calvary. People say, well, that's not, you're saying that wrong because there's only one way to be saved and it's by belief in Jesus Christ. You're right, there's only one way to be saved and that's through Jesus Christ, the belief in Jesus Christ. But there's more than one way to the cross. In other words, you can get saved right here, and you also get saved right here. You can get saved in your car. You can get saved in your truck. You can get saved in the parking lot. You can get saved at Walmart. You better be saved to go to Walmart. But you, know. you can get saved at home, living room, the bedroom. Had somebody told me that they got saved on while they knelt down and bowed at the toilet. At their house, that was the only place they could find quiet and peacefulness. Okay, that's fine with me. It don't matter. And let me tell you something else. There's more than one way to worship God. Some people worship God by sitting. Some people worship God by standing and raising their hands. Some people worship God by speaking in tongues. Some people worship God by just saying hallelujah. Some people are quiet. Some people are loud. Some people are meek and don't really show a fuss. And some people are very excited. What we must understand and realize is there's multiple personalities and there's multiple ways to the cross. There's only one way to God through the cross of Calvary. Does does that make sense? I hope that makes sense there. But all of those things, Brother Larry, all of those things hinges on our belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If that's not present, you can jump and do 14 jumping jacks. It don't mean you're going to be saved. You can do 15. It still don't mean you're saved. There's numerous ways we accept the witness of other people. We need to listen to various witnesses and decide Who's telling the truth based on their testimonies? If we act on the basis of human witness, how much more should we rely on the witness of God? Let me tell you something. And I've learned this more and more every day. People can and will deceive you. God will not. He is the personification of truth. His testimony Verse 9 tells us that what God says is always truth. And you can always trust in Him. Those who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they are trying to make the Father out to be a liar. That's verse 10. But nothing shows more disdain towards God than a liar. That's Titus chapter 1. In verse 2, God does not lie. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, For what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make faith of God without effect? God forbid. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Let me tell you something, man will, will, will trick you and, and, and trip you up and try to deceive you. I've had people come into this church, and they'll sit here and they'll raise their hands and they'll hallelujah, make it out to be that they're a great and wonderful Christian. And they, go, they leave these four walls, they act anything but a Christian. You may think that you're fooling the pastor or the Sunday school teacher or, or, or whomever, But you're not fooling God. Amen? 
And that's what we've got to realize and understand. There's overwhelming evidence that as a Christian we need to follow after what God has laid down before us. I became a Christian. There's an author, he wrote this. This is not me, this is an author who wrote this. It says this, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and the only Son of God who proved His divinity by raising from the dead. This meant following Him was the most rational, logical step that one could make is to follow the Son of God. Let's take a look at verse 12 and 13. First John chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 13. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 13. Or do I have? Yeah, I do. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. In the clearest, plainest possible language, John draws a distinction between those who have received Christ in their heart and those who have not. It is the difference between being spiritually alive and spiritually dead. Only those who have Christ have life by faith. Christ lives and reigns within those who have accepted Him as their Lord and Savior. The moment we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we experience a new life. A life, in though, in, in a life which those who reject Christ will never receive. People that are not saved. Let's take it from this angle. Sinners. We can throw. We know. We know what a sinner is, right? Sinner. You can look at the the fruit that a tree bears, and you know that person's a sinner. Okay. This is not judgment. People. People have a misconception of that. I look at this, and I know it's black. Why? Because. It's black. I know that's black. And so, you know, that, that's not a judgment thing. That's I'm um, stating a fact, right? Well, you can look at somebody and you can see the fruit that they bear. You have people that are in the center category. They are not a, they're not a Christian. But then you also have miserable churchgoers that are sinners. Because they go to church trying to put the outward appearance of being saved, yet they're still seeking something to fill a void in their life. Does that make sense? And what we must realize and understand is there's only one way to fill that void, and that is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, accepting Him as our Lord and Savior, Redeemer. We must understand that the only way to fill that void is by enjoying a life as a Christian. We enter into a foretaste of what we enjoy or will enjoy on an exponentially larger scale for all eternity. As Christians, if we can't get along here, what makes you going to think you're going to get along over yonder? If we're Christians, guess what? We're going to spend eternity together. I love those church folks that try to avoid me. They try to get away from me. What they must realize and understand is as a child of God, you're going to have to interact at some point with a Christian, either here or over yonder. We're going to interact with one another. Amen. First John chapter 5 and verse 13, the apostle says that he is writing to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God so that they may know they have eternal life. I know I have eternal life because I've accepted 
Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The false teachers of John's day had vigorously denied the sonship of Christ. And lest some believer might have doubts about their standing with Christ, John offers these words of encouragement. For those in his day and all generations to follow, the apostle offers the assurance of eternal life to those who believe on the name of the Son of God. Look at verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. There are things that I know. I know. This is something that you've got assurance in that you can know. If you believe in the name of the Son of God, you have eternal life. And because of that, we can, last section, we can live confidently in God. We can live confidently in God. There are things that I'm confident about. There are things I'm confident about. If I look outside and I see the trees are doing this number, I'm not talking about this number. I'm talking about this number. I'm confident in knowing the wind's blowing. If I look outside and I see water coming from the sky, I'm confident in knowing that it is raining. Does all that make sense? I know right now I can look outside, the sun is shining. I've looked at the weather report, and the weather says that it's going to be, um, it says it's 71 right now, and it says it's going to be 81, 83 degrees today. Now, do I, am I confident in knowing that it's going to be 83 exactly today? No. no. It's going to be close. I, be, I believe that it's going to be close. I would probably venture to say within five degrees one way or another. <laughs> That's a big error, m- margin of error, right? But I have confidence to know that it's not going to be 40 outside. I'm confident in that. But then I also know we live in Alabama. Weather changes at a moment. There are things that I have confidence in. I also have confidence in knowing that God is God. I have confidence in knowing that I can ask anything according to His will, and He shall do that for me. Take a look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And, and this is the confidence that we have towards Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, that's, that's key, He will hear us. And if we know that He hears us, In whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. There's something that a lot of Christians need to get in their mindset. As a child of God, I can go boldly to the throne room of God. I don't have to tiptoe around about it. I don't have to sneak in slyly. I have confidence in knowing I can go boldly to the throne room of God. Why? Because I am a child of God. The idea of Christians being able to go boldly and approach God, that is found several places throughout the Word of God. And it is supported by uh, the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 uh, through 16. Seeing then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus is the Son of God. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, but in all points was tempted just as we are, but he did not sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. We can approach the throne of God, the throne of grace, with confidence. When our prayers are in accordance, look at verse 14 again. Is it 14? Yeah, look at verse 14 again. We can approach 
the throne of grace with confidence, with our prayers, that our prayers are in accordance to God's will. And then we know it shall be done. Now, it is God's will that none would suffer, right? The Bible says that. However, we also must understand this is a human body. It has frailties. It is not, in, it is not infallible. This body will get arthritis. This body has to wear glasses. Okay? This body will lose its hair. This body is not perfect. This body is going to have pains and aches. This body, this body is going to do those things. But guess what? This body, I am still a child of God. And to that end, I know that if I go boldly to the throne room of God and I ask according to His will, He is going to hear me and He's going to grant to me not what I think I need, but according to His will, He will grant to me. Whatsoever we ask in Jesus' name, God is going to do it. The Lord favorably regards any prayer we offer in Jesus' name. When we humbly submit to His will, God is going to grant the petition because we are asking for His glory and ultimately our good. But it's got to be according to His will. Use this example before. Poor old Ronnie Madsen. He'd say all the time, I want, I want a new vehicle. Okay, well, we're going to be praying that you get a new vehicle. He said, I'm praying that I get a red Ferrari. Well, that, my friend, was not according to God's will for his life. <laughs> because Ronnie couldn't afford that. Okay. I was so tempted to buy him one of them old hot rods or hot wheels like that. But he got a good working truck that, that was exactly what he needed when he needed a vehicle. He didn't get a monster truck. And here's what we've got to realize and understand. You can ask some outlandish thing, but the facts are, is that according to God's will for your life? We must pray things according to the will of God. Let's take a look at verse 16 and 17. This, these last two verses that I'm going to look at, I'm going to close just a few minutes early. These last two verses I want to look at. The subtitle of this in, in your Sunday school lesson is Pray for a Faltering Brother. Look at what these scriptures say. Scripture says this, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he will ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sin that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that anyone should pray for that. Verse 17. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. John follows his strong statement related to being to prayers being answered, and he gives a few specific instructions. He calls on Christians to pray for fellow believers who get caught up in sinful activity. When, by an impulse of the Holy Spirit, a Christian realizes that another believer has fallen into sin. The Christian is to go to God in prayer on behalf of that faltering believer. Many times people will ask me, well, why didn't you just go to that person and confront them on their sin? Well, sometimes God allows that, but most of the time I don't do that. Why? That's not the way God works. But I'm praying that God would open that and reveal that to them. We pray for them that God would give them that, that still small voice in the back of their head. There are times for confronting sin.
There are times that we go to that person that has got us this sin in their life. There are times that we do that. But as a Christian as a whole, what we are to do is we are to pray for them. Hold them up to God in prayer. The assurance is God will answer their prayer and bring renewed life to the one who has succumbed to temptation. Jesus set us an example in the case of Peter. Foreseeing Peter would fail, Jesus interceded for him. He said to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, that you will get strength and encouragement. However, there is a sin unto death. The apostle does not advise believers to pray for those guilty of such sin. Nor will the Holy Spirit prompt the Christian to pray for them. There are sins out of the Old Testament that is punishable by death. In the New Testament, as you might remember a, a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira, they were guilty of lying to the Holy Spirit and they received their ultimate reward, instantaneous death. You don't lie to the Holy Spirit. There is a form of apostasy which there is no recovery. When a, re when a person rejects Jesus as the way of salvation, there is, there remains no sacrifice for that sin. When a person rejects Jesus as the way of salvation, there it remains no sacrifice for sin. Brother Andy, that ain't biblical. That is actually Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. There is also blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which there shall not be forgiveness. Matthew chapter 12, 22 through 32. Intentional, knowing, attributing miraculous works of Christ to the devil. That is something that is wrongdoing. And needs to be repentance of. What we must realize and understand. There is a way of salvation. We must trust in him for that way of salvation. Amen. Live feed, thank you so much for joining with us this Sunday morning. We're going to be joined back at about 11 o'clock. Join us back at 11 o'clock for our Sunday morning worship. Remember, if you have a prayer request. You can visit the website that's listed below. Text the keyword prayer to 205-642-8744. We want to partner together with you in prayer. May God bless you. See you at 11 o'clock. Amen.